Hello wonderful people of YouTube and welcome to another video on the Ashen Chevalier. First let me apologise for having such a long gap in between. I had a few things going on all at once and it all got a bit much but I'm back and I'm hoping to run through these summaries to get everyone prepared for Trials into Reverie before it drops in the West later this year. It's pretty ambitious to target before Trials to Azure in March but let's see what happens. In this video, we'll be going through Chapter 1 of Trolls of Cold Steel 2, and as usual, if you are intending on playing it yourself, just come back and visit me after. You know the drill, into the pits of Gehenna. Chapter 1 opens in Amir with Ween explaining that due to the low number of assailants, fortunately, the damage to Amir and its habitats wasn't as bad as it could have been. Although Baron Teo, his father, still remains in a deep sleep after being heavily wounded against the Jaegers. Reen and Tovel are ready to leave Amir and get a wonderfully warm goodbye from Lucia, Reen's mother. Selina, of course, tags along with them and so they make their way over to Valimar. Whilst talking with Valimar, he makes it apparent that he can detect who is around him and notices that Elise is missing from the group, concerned that something may have happened. He seems to know what is going on around him to some extent. Reen explains that they will be leaving the region to rescue Elise and Princess Alvin as well as finding his classmates. Valamar asks if he is referring to those that were with him during the trial to become an Awakener. It turns out that Valamar knows all of his friends are in three different regions and they appear to be well and alive. Celine explains that Valamar was able to link Reen and his friends as the Awakener as secondary contractors. Valamar is also able to travel spirit paths which connect many different regions together where animistic monuments are situated around Erebonia. The group make a choice to travel to the Keldic region where three of Green's friends are. Unfortunately, he doesn't know who they are, just that there are three of them. As we go through the spirit path, Green swears he will reunite with all of his friends. The spirit path leads to Lanaria Nature Park just outside Keldic Highway. Reen and Selene notice that the higher elements are in play within this region, just like the old schoolhouse in Trista. Making their way to Keldic Highway Main, the higher elements are only in play within the park itself, and not the highway. Curious. Whilst making our way toward Keldic, Reen recalls that East Trista isn't so far away, and wants to put his mind at ease at least. So, making their way up East Trista Highway as close as they can get before noticing, Panzer soldat stationed at what seems to be a checkpoint for the Noble Alliance. Since there's no way to get through at this time, Reen, now somewhat more relaxed, agrees to head to Keldic proper. Tovar mentions that he was hoping to get to Trista to be able to catch up with Mip. If you don't remember who that is, he was a special merchant back in Trista and clearly seems to be well connected. Arriving in Keldic, Reen attempts to gather as much information as possible from any previous links and find anyone from Thor's Academy. Becky is in one of the houses and explains that Hugo was able to create a secure route for some students to escape, however he doesn't seem to be around here anymore. Margo from the Inn Tavern tells us that no one has been around the area, otherwise she would recognise them, though she does mention that there is some sort of fighting going on around the eastern border at Gorelia Fortress and the Twin Dragons Bridge. Rosine is in the Grand Market being hassled by some drunken provincial soldiers. Toval puts his acting hat on and really sends them for a spin before they agree to pass his name, Phil, on as a merchant who wants to talk to the head honchos of the guardhouse. They drag themselves away and Rosine tells us the same story as Becky. Having spoken to the important links, the group realises that they have nothing to go on from here, when a boy really pushes a copy of the Imperial Chronicle onto them. It seems that the Alliance has full control over the contents and Machias' dad has also been arrested. Celine notices a piece of paper stuck on the last page, which appears to be some sort of map of the East Keldic Highway. After discussing what the map and the clue could represent, we head to the end of East Keldic Highway 1, where a chest contains another piece of paper, another hint, and an old key. Deciphering the second message leads Reen to the windmill and lo and behold, the key fits perfectly and the door opens. Once inside, you may have figured out who it is already, but we meet Machias again. Reen rushes in for a hug and exclaims that he thought he would never see him again. Machias beautifully reminds Reen that it's because he kept his promise to come back and find everyone again that allowed him to also keep his promise of seeing each other again. Of course, neither of them had any intention of going down in that battle over a month ago anyway. Machias begins to fill us in on what happened since then, starting with the courageous appearing at Trista to help Class 7 escape. 
It was Victor Arsade who was on board and encouraged Class 7 to flee as today is not the day to go down. From there, the Azure Knight went in pursuit of the Courageous, while Class 7 split into three groups and fled. Unfortunately, what happened to the Courageous after that is unknown. Elliot and Fee are currently out surveying the area, however they are also safe. They are due to call Maki as soon to report back, but still have some time left for that. Meanwhile, they, took, they take a monster on and retrieve some ingredients for the priest at the church, soon heading back to the windmill. Ellie and Fee call in, and it seems that the security around the Twin Dragons Bridge is airtight, requiring a permit from either the Kreutzen Provincial Army or the Noble Alliance, making it difficult for civilians and merchants to get through. Marcius breaks the news that Reen is with them, and naturally, Elliot and Fee are overjoyed by being able to hear his voice again. Elliot wonders if this is a dream and gets cut off because Fee pinches to check. Elliot tells Fee that she should be pinching herself to check, not anyone else. The friendships are hilariously heartwarming. Um, Reen and Marcius agree to meet up at Point D, which is a spot that should be hidden from the provincial army's view. Arriving at Point D, Elliot too reminds Reen how important he is to the team and he never once stopped believing that Reen was alive and well somewhere and would make it back to them. Fee appears on the hill just above them, jumping down straight onto Reen. I swear this is the cutest reunion of them all. Fee of course tells Reen that she wanted to see him again and would never let her new family be taken away from her, to which Reen is thankful that he has a place to go back to. After a little chatter, the group decides to try and make it through the Twin Dragons Bridge, and Fee found a potentially hidden path that would take them through without a hitch, and so off we go. Entering the Twin Dragons Bridge, it's clear to see how heavily guarded the place is. Guards, panzer soldats, and tanks, and of course it is one of the biggest strongholds boasting the greatest offensive power in Erebonia. Fee mentions that the group could use the tracks to get past the guards, and Reen agrees that it is likely the safest and also the only option they have right now. Reen asks some merchants in the waiting area how difficult it is to pass, and as they approach the back end of the waiting area where the rooms are, a hooded man appears claiming to be a merchant forced to waste away here. He remains mysterious but knows who Class 7 and the Bracer are, running around the corner teasing the group to catch them if they can. The hooded man seems to have disappeared in the dead end before Fee notices a breeze and a ventilation shaft that he may have escaped through. As Reen and the group follow through, they end up outside right on the tracks wondering if this was a hooded man's intent all along. Making their way to the other side of the tracks, the scene pans back to an outcrop overlooking the train tracks, the hooded man chuckles and suggests that this is all the help he can give for now, removing his hood. I'd figured out who this might be right from the first scene, but if you can't tell from this scene, then I won't ruin the surprise for you. Once Reen and friends make it across the bridge to the other side, they head toward Grelia Fortress via a byroad. As we enter the area, Fee seems to sense something from above them, but chooses to ignore it and continue. Partway down the road is a shrine that Toval doesn't seem to remember ever being there, considering he's been up and down this byroad quite a lot. Reen likens it to the old schoolhouse back in Trista. Celine, however, states that there is no need to go in here at this time, but she won't stop them if they want to anyway. Inside the Terra Shrine's last room, three enemies appear before another door at the back of this room. Once the enemies have been defeated, the group analyse the door. Upon closer inspection, the emblem on the door is the exact same as the one in the old schoolhouse too, but Reen realises he won't get anything out of Celine, so he agrees to leave. Just as he begins to walk away, he feels something flowing inside of him, switching to another scene depicting a young man and his subordinate among a burning town. The young man laments on the meaning of war, killing innocent people and burning their homes to force out enemy combatants, resolving to put an end to it before fading back to Reen. Of course, he wonders what just happened, acknowledging that it wasn't just a hallucination, rather it felt real. Celine seems to know something, but as usual, will not tell us right now. Finally making their way to Gorelia Fortress, they are confronted by the huge gaping hole that was blown through the fortress, completely stunned by the sight of it. The city with the blue glow is Crosswell City, which apparently has a big absolute power that was used to do this to the fortress, and is the reason for the barrier. Tervall notes that whatever happened in Crossbell happened around the same time as when the war broke out in Erebonia, so they are likely linked and probably involves Ouroboros in some way. 
Nevertheless, the group must make their way to the 4th Armoured Division's proving ground across the other side. As they move on, Makia steps on a mine, from which Fee saves him and calls the culprits out. They both comment that Fee seems to be doing well and hasn't lost her touch, and others recognise them from Heimdall during the national address, as well as from Le Grand with Du Kayen. Toval tells the group to be careful since they are from Zephyr, the Jaeger group that Fee was a part of. After some catching up with Fee, the Jaeger's rules state that if the goals are conflicting, they are enemies and must fight with everything they've got to pass. Zeno pulls out a huge blade rifle and Leonardas a huge mechanised gauntlet, and the fight begins. They manage to make it through somehow, but the two Zephyr members get up again, easily, and are ready for round two, when soldats appear from the biro chasing the two away. Reen calls Valimar to take care of the soldats. Despite retrieving a weapon for Valimar and defeating two dragons, the commanding officer resolves to surround him and defeat Reen and Valimar, until a fearless voice shouts, ENOUGH! Enter the 4th Armoured Division, with tanks and lots of firepower. The soldats are confused as to why the 4th Armoured Division are here since they should be busy with the force from the Transcontinental Railroad, to which the red-haired general responds with... Bah! Nothing more than a small diversion! And I suggest you turn and run off with your tails between your legs if you don't want to share their fate, unless you men think you can handle the might of the 4th Armoured Div- As it starts to look a bit bad, with the soldats not seeming to want to give up, Captain Claire destroys the sensor of the commanding officer. Zephyr disappears considering the icy maiden could very easily aim for them if she wanted to, and the soldats finally back off. Elliot is finally able to speak with his dad, and of course this means that his dad wants a hug. Captain Claire introduces herself and we move to the proven ground to discuss the current situation. Once everybody has been able to greet everybody again and have a nice little catch up, Lieutenant General Craig eventually asks Reen what they intend to do going forward, i.e. which side will they fight for. The four members of Class 7 agree that Valimar is extremely powerful and neither side can ignore him. However, they also need to rescue Princess Alfin and Elise from the Noble Alliance still. It's not possible to answer at the moment, not all of Class 7's input is being considered and that is how Class 7 rolls. So the first mission is to locate all of Class 7, then they can decide on which side to fight for as part of this war. Captain Claire suggests tagging along to her mirror as well, since it's a remote region she could use to communicate with other regions and fortify the security of the area too. So later that day, they use a spirit path to travel back to Ymir. Back in Ymir, Reen's father is still unconscious, however, his condition is better and it seems that he will fully recover after some more rest. That's good news. The next day, after some bonding events to get to know his friends better, Reen and others head back to Valamar to find out where the other Car 7 members are. Valamar tells them that there are three in the Nord region and another three in the Lagarm region. This time, we're off to Nord. Using the spirit path, we arrive at the Stone Circles area where we met Milliam for the first time. Heading towards Zendigate, a fight breaks out between the Imperial Army and the Noble Alliance, where One-Eyed Zex is able to fend them off, pushing them back to the Watchtower by using older tank models as diversions. Once they arrive at Zendigate, they meet with Lieutenant General Zex, who tells them that the Noble Alliance have taken over the Watchtower some time ago and are using it as a base for their attacks from both sides of the borders. It seems the Noble Alliance joined hands with the Calvert Republic to attack the Watchtower from both sides, leaving them with no chance. The enemy of an enemy is a friend, you know? All the communications are also out ever since, so they haven't been able to call for reinforcements from mainland. With that in mind, Reen and the group head off to the settlement to find their three friends. As they enter the settlement, it's empty. Not long after arriving, they are ambushed by Needhaga, a Jaeger Corps. After wearing them down in the first battle, they call in for reinforcements in the form of monsters. What looks like a bird flies across the Jaeger Corps, catching them off guard. Gaia swoops in and takes them all down. The Jaeger Corps flees back to the Watchtower after receiving a communication via their orbital devices. Strange, theirs works, why doesn't anything else work? Gaius tells the group that they have moved to the northern part of Nord when the war broke out. After speaking with Gaius's father, they make their way to the northeastern part of Nord where Elisa, Milliam and Gwen are. As they approach, they see a massive beast attacking them. Milliam and Lisa attack it, but they aren't strong enough by themselves. Celine reminds us that this is a cryptid and shouldn't be taken lightly. Reen and the group take down the beast together. Celine reveals these cryptids shouldn't normally be appearing on these planes, however, 
Some abnormality seems to be disrupting the spirit veins, and it's not the wall. It seems as though the watchtower has an orbital wave jammer connected to it, which is causing the disruption to communication. Finally, able to reunite with Elisa and Milliam, we return to Lake Lakaruma, where the new settlement has been set up, and sit down to discuss the next steps. Of course, the main mission is to remove the orbital wave jammer and take those out at the watchtower. However, this is easier said than done. The highlands are being watched closely via airships, tanks, and soldats. Lakan believes that they are not completely safe at Lake Lakaruma as the wall continues to expand. There is no guarantee this area will not be affected either. Gaius and the others agree with Lakan and start to make plans to evacuate. However, Reen encourages the group to do something about it rather than evacuate and leave their homeland behind. And so the entire group is taken in by the youth within class 7 and agree to take down the Watchtower's orbital wave jammer device. This isn't taking sides with the Imperial Army since the jamming device is causing disruption for the people of Norn, and therefore it is the right thing to do in the interest of those of the Highlands. Elisa remembers that there was a plateau where the orbital mortars were set up to attack the Watchtower during their field study. It's hidden from sight and would be the perfect place to infiltrate from. First though, some side quests. They defeat some military monsters, save a runaway horse, find a momentum from an Imperial soldier that was killed during the fight earlier, and investigate the mysterious Arya Shrine. Similar to before, Gaius has no idea that this road nor shrine ever existed here. Seems suspicious considering Gaius has been here since birth. Once Reen reaches the end, they find another door with the same emblem imprinted from the old schoolhouse. Again, as Reen begins to walk away from the door, a memory appears. This one depicts the same young man from before speaking with the warriors of the Highlands in the past, advising them, should they come along, they may never be able to return home again. The warrior explains that he is family and as one that loves the Nord Highlands all the same, and therefore the answer will always be the same, as they fight by the young man's side. Family needs no reason to help another, nor do they seek anything in return. They will follow the winds and the goddess at this time, and it leads to fighting alongside the young man. Green confirms this time that it wasn't just a hallucination, in fact, it seemed as though he was in the memories of someone else. Now, infiltrating the watchtower, they are immediately confronted by provincial army soldiers. Taking them out, they push to the next floor, where Needhogger appears again. Further up, another group of Needhogger attack, and this time it's a pincer attack, forcing their way through to the rooftop. On the rooftop, they are hindered by Blue Blanc and, a black and the black clad girl who kidnapped Princess Alfin and Elise. She isn't with Ouroboros, rather she is simply cooperating with the Noble Alliance, similar to Crow and Zephyr. She finally introduces herself as Altina Orion, same surname as Millian. Hmm. Her code name is the Black Rabbit, and Kalamsalaeus, her doll. Not quite the same as Ergatlem, but you can see what's pretty obvious here. After a fight, Altina notes that she does not know where Princess Alvin or Elise are since she last delivered them to Rufus Arboreal. From there, Claire decides it's time to apprehend them, not realising that they still have the upper hand as Blue Blunt uses a shadow weaving technique to prevent Class 7 and Claire from moving. As it seems all hope is lost, Reen engages his power in order to break free, even acknowledged and pushed by Blue Blunt encouraging Reen to unleash his power, as it is possible that he could break free. But... Ha ha! You're as fascinating as always! With the strength of an ogre, you may very well be able to break free of my shadow weaving. Go! Unleash the mystery within yourself! That won't be necessary. What? Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa! Were those wires? Sharon? How in the world? Is that really you, Sharon? But of course, I've come to collect you, my lady. Sharon swoops in and removes the needles holding Class 7 down. Sharon and Blue Blanc have a conversation where Sharon states that she is not acting as Enforcer Number 9 of Ouroboros at this time, simply as a maid for the Reinford family, and therefore protecting Elisa and her friends from any harm. 
Soon after, the Noble Alliance appear with airships and sword arts, and so Reen calls Valamar to take them down, causing them to flee from the Watchtower. Heed my call. Valamar, Valamar the, the Ashen, Ashen Knight! Knight! Blue Blanc and Altina make moves to disappear, with Blue Blanc stating that this stage has only just been set, and this is just the beginning. He is curious to see how Class 7 will act and which position they will take within this crisis. After regrouping at Late Lacrima, Reen and others head back through the spirit path to Amir, where Baron Shorza has awakened. Yay! <laughs> the, the next day, Reen asks Balamar to confirm the location of the remaining three class members. He notes that there are two in Legram now, and the third is unknown, and so the destination is set. They arrive on the Ebel Highway, a short distance from Legram, enveloped in a thick, dense fog, and the higher elements are in play too. Once in Legram, they are met with Butler Klaus and Miles, a new guy running the Bracer Guild here. Klaus tells them that Laura and Emma are here, although just left to Lohengrin Castle as Emma sensed something. Fortunately, Laura returned to Legram shortly after the war broke out with the other classmates, though the Viscount hasn't been seen since he was on the Courageous. But Klaus worries that the thick fog, having lasted a month already, is causing unrest for the people of Legram. Further to this, there are never before seen monsters appearing on the highways, and no explanation as to why that might be happening either. Klaus provides them with a boat as we head for Lehengren Castle. On their way, they wonder about the fog, where Selene mentions it must be a manifestation of the chaos in Erebonia, similar to the higher elements. Whatever Emma sensed over at the castle could very well be the cause. She lets it slip that she came to Lehengren Castle with them last time, however, this was because of her duties as a familiar, ensuring the castle didn't have any undesirable effects on Reen as a potential awakener. She continues to tell the story of once upon a time a divine knight just like the Ashen and Azure knight supposedly slumbered here, though she has only heard ancient legends about it and never actually seen it herself. The point is, the divine knight and the awakener that used to reside there are now gone completely. As soon as they step through the doors of Lehengren Castle, Laura and Emma are in the midst of a battle against a cryptid. They make quick work of it with great teamwork when another suddenly appears in front of them this time a much more powerful one. Reen and the others join the fight this time and fight their hardest, managing to take down the cryptid. Now with the monsters down, Laura and Emma are finally able to re-meet Reen after such a long time. As they make their way back to Legram, they notice the fog is a little less dense than it was on its way. They continue to talk about Eustace's whereabouts. It seems he fled with Emma and Laura to Legram and then boarded a train to Boreahard several days ago as he was concerned about the region itself. Well, at least we know he's safe. Still on the boat, Emma decides to start talking about herself, Selene, and the Divine Knights and the Awakeners. It seems she's finally ready to fulfil the promise she made in the after party. She enrolled at Thor's Academy as part of her duties as a Witch of the Hexen Clan, a clan of witches that traces its origins back into the past. Far back into the past. They must watch over the fragments of the Great Power, seal deep underground and observe whatever comes to pass regarding them. Emma continues that the Divine Knights choose their Awakener, and that Chosen One will be drawn into an unavoidable battle. Despite knowing all of this, she wasn't able to say anything until now, and therefore she doesn't think that she deserves to be called their classmate. Reen reminds Emma that she is just as much a part of Class 7 as any one of them. He has his strange power, Crow has his past, Emma has her past, it's no different, and without Emma, they wouldn't be the Class 7 that they are. Fortunately, he gets through to Emma, and all his happy smiles again. Perfect timing too, because Legram comes into review, and they hear a massive roaring airship approaching the mainland. Laura greets the guests alone in the mansion entrance, since Viscount Arsaid isn't around. They are introduced as General Aurelia Le Guin, the Golden Rakshasa, and Brigadier General Wallace Bardius, the Black Whirlwind, and they seem crazy intimidating, even I could feel it outside of the screen. Damn. The Black Whirlwind, unparalleled spearmanship, and has Nord blood running through him too. He does kind of look similar to Gaius, right? Emma wonders if he could be the descendant of the warriors from Nord that fought with Emperor Drykors during the War of the Lions. 
The Golden Rakshasa is a countess and head of the Le Guin family, as well as commander of the Le Maire Provincial Army, and she is a practitioner of both the Arsene and Van der Schools of swordsmanship. Whew. She seems crazy strong by herself, no wonder they are dubbed as the two strongest generals in the Provincial Army. Laura offers them some tea and a sit down, however, General Le Guin tells her that there is no need as the Viscount not being here has given them all that they need. Brigadier General Badius tells her not to be troubled, they aren't here to criticise anyone for the Crimson Wings appearance near Trista, but he suggests that if it came to it, their present neutral position in the war would likely be thrown out for their personal sense of justice. General Le Guin assures them that they have plenty of opponents at the moment, so should slow down with the cutting words. She continues that Laura should fight under her one day, as she sees potential that may even surpass her given sufficient practice. Whilst Laura is pleased to hear this, she brushes it off as inexperienced at the moment and would like to be able to beat her father first. Bardius makes it clear that they can sense the others in the other room peeking through the door, and they both agree that they have great potential within them. With that, they take their leave as Butler Klaus lets them out, but not before Le Guin challenges him to a battle, to which he tells her that an old man like him would hardly be a worthy opponent for her. Badias comments that they couldn't be so sure of that since he hasn't let his guard down for a second since they entered the ground. Finally gone, Laura collapses to her knees, apologising to her friends that it took all she had not to be overwhelmed by their presence. The rest of the group could feel it harshly enough and they weren't even in the room. With generals like them and others on their side, there is no room for underestimating them at any point. Leaving Le Grand, the group make their way to Bereahard along the Ebor Highway and then the South Croatian Highway. Upon arrival at the Bereahard gates, Emma uses a spell on the guards to avoid getting caught, considering Class 7 is likely very high on the list of wanted criminals according to the Noble Alliance. Inside, they decide to collect as many clues as they can about Yusuf's whereabouts, starting with Colette, a fellow Thor's Military Academy student in the Jewelers. She tells us that there are rumours around Eusus. He came home not long ago and has been helping the Duke ever since, such as commanding the provincial army in town. Next, another Thor student, Teresia is upstairs in the shopping area, Christie's Galleria. She tells the group that she escaped with Emily and Ferris, but isn't sure where they are at the moment. Unfortunately, she also doesn't have any new information on Eusus' whereabouts. So, the group head outside on Station Street. While outside, two kids approach Reen and tell him that there is a message for him, but they can't say who it's from. Head to the restaurant in the central plaza post haste. That is all. When they arrive there, owner Hammond no doubt has another message for them. Make your way to the airport post haste, I shall await you there. End. Okay, so at the airport, there is a single airship parked up. As they approach, mechanic Cran approaches them and passes on the final message. Make your way to the lounge on the third floor post haste. Aboard the airship, Reen heads to the third floor and finally we get to re-meet Eusus. Eusus, being Eusus, tells them he wondered if they were ever going to come at all anyway. And Elliot rightly points out that if he hadn't sent them all over the place, they would have arrived much faster. And Eusus, being Eusus, tells them that this was his way of protecting them as it would be, have been too suspicious if they came here directly. Perhaps you should try thanking me, Yusa says. <laughs> Still, at least he is well and it's great to see him again, no? Yusa feels the same and is happy to see Reen again, despite all of the ordeals that he no doubt had to go through to make it here. He had always had high expectations of Reen though, so it shouldn't be that surprising. Yusa continues that Reen has made good on his word and shown him exactly what noblesse oblige means to him, and he hopes that he has done the same too. Lorene agrees that he has, and wonders if he'd have been able to do it all alone like Eusus. Finally, all of Class 7 is back together, except for Crow. The group rejoices. Not long before, Eusus explains that he has been kept informed of their activity, so he knows about Valamar, and that they have decided not to align with the Imperial Army, but fight as a third faction instead. With that in mind, Eusus didn't arrange for them just to see each other again. He wanted to make their positions very clear meaning he doesn't intend to go with them. He is, after all, the son of one of the most influential figures in the Noble Alliance, and has been commanding the provincial army as part of this. 
He also feels regret for the attack on Emir, which his father ordered and therefore the gulf between them is too big to be filled. Reen understands why he feels somewhat responsible for what happened in Emir, and why, as an Alborea, there may be certain things expected of him, and tells Eustace that his dad woke up the other day and will make a full recovery. Eustace is relieved and wishes that he could go see him personally, however with the circumstances as they are, that would prove pretty difficult. Reen makes it clear that it wasn't to make Eustace feel guilty, he wants to ensure he isn't making his choice because of that. He wishes to know what Eustace wants, and the path that he wants to take. If personally he agrees with the ideals of the Noble Alliance, that's fine, but if he is doing this because he feels like he has to, or any other reason, then he's a coward who is running away, and that's not how a real Erebonian noble should act. They should do what they believe is right with pride. He continues that they are just students and are still learning. They can't talk about solving the war, nor the class divide that started it, but that's why they need to come together as a class again. It is exactly their inexperience, different backgrounds and social standings and unique experiences that have shaped them. By putting those together is the only way to overcome whatever life throws at them. Eustace realises he was right all along. Reen has always been the one to free him of his hesitations. Still, as an Alborea, he has duties and responsibilities to fulfil. For that reason, he proposes a duel in the form of a race and a battle. The scene changes to show a girl outside watching the group inside the airship. She states that she was to gather information on the Crimson Wings and doesn't report to Duke Alborea, but why not watch? A man standing next to her tells her to do whatever she wants and he'll go kill some time in town or something. The girl abruptly tells him to stay right there and actually act like he has a number rather than her babysitting him. Over on the Oryx Canyon Road, Reen and Eustace get ready for their race. Eustace used his family's influence to have Angelica's bike bought here from the academy and it's been well serviced since. Reen will be riding the bike, and Yusuf will be riding his horse. They'll finish at the plateau where they fought the monster in their field study. Once they're there, they will fight. If Yusuf loses, he will concede and go with them, but he will be giving it everything he has so it won't be easy. Of course, Reen wins, and the fight begins. Reen wins again! Yay! With the duel over, Eustace concedes and decides to go with them, declaring he is once again a member of Class 7, and he will show his father and brother how he believes that the Alborea name should be carried. Just as all the congratulations begin, that same girl and man from the previous scene, outside the airship, drop it. Toval seems to know who they are. With her great sense of humour, the girl sarcastically greets them and hopes that they don't mind her breaking up their reunion so soon. She introduces herself as Duvali, the head knight of the Star Ritter, an esteemed group led by Ouroboros' seventh Anguis, in all her glory, and that this is the reason she is here today. Toval is shocked by the mention of the seventh Anguis and asks if it could possibly be the Steel Maiden. Laura astutely asks if the Star Ritter is somehow related to the Eisen Ritter. The names are pretty similar, with the only difference in name both being a metal, iron steel. Duvali mocks Laura by telling her that she isn't going to tell her, and it must be bugging her. Her curiosity will build and build and eat away at her so she can't sleep at night. <laughs> it must suck to be her. The group are a bit stunned and wonder if she really is with Ouroboros, and Laura assures Duvali that she isn't really that bothered, and it, she wouldn't want to pressure her into answering something if she doesn't want to. Nice one, Laura. Reen concerns that she is extremely powerful, even though she doesn't act like it. Toval adds that this guy with her is a complete monster as far as power goes. Since Duvili has introduced herself, it's only right that her colleague do the same, but he hasn't even moved from the cliff yet. She shouts at him to get over here right now, to which he wonders why she needs him. She can take him alone. She reminds him that he is supposed to be number one, shouldn't he put at least some effort into his job? Joining Duvili is McBurn, the almighty conflagration. He releases part of his power which forms like black flames around him. Seems familiar, huh? After a fight, they are able to get Duvili down, but McBurn tones it down and wonders if that's all they've got. Staring at Reen, he asks if he's mixed. 
Ween has no idea what he means. So McBurn says he'll let it go if Ween hasn't noticed himself. He's not going to tell him. Besides, it can't be that much if he hasn't noticed it anyway. Emma and Selene are noticeably confused, but McBurn decides to leave. Duvali admits that this is quite a lot for her to handle by herself, but McBurn isn't interested unless one of them could seriously give him a run for his mirror. But it doesn't look like... And then, a run for his mirror appears in the form of Instructor Sarah Valestein, the Purple Lightning. Pushing them back, Reen and friends are able to get back up to their feet for another standoff. Reen lets out more of his power, shocking everyone, including Duvali standing right next to him, who would prefer if he didn't set her on fire in the process. Before the second round can begin, the Duke appears on the road below, wondering who is up there. He shouts at Eustace for leaving a letter like that and leaving, and demands that he listens and returns with him. Eustace explains that he has outlined exactly what he intends to do, he will return with his friends, walk his own path, and find out for himself how he should live as one who bears the Valvarea name. Shortly after, the Duke calls in a new soldat model, Hector, a massive tank-like soldat, and so Ween calls in Valamar. Once the fight is over, Ween and Valamar jump up to the plateau and open up a spirit path with support from Emma. Eustace bids his father farewell once more, and off they go. Back in Amir, the whole group meets up in the mansion, of course relieved that they were able to find everyone. Millian runs in for a hug from Eustace who moves out of the way, and Machias lasts not even 30 seconds before wanting to kill him. Seems like everything is normal again, right? The next day, Class 7 decide to meet up in the Phoenix Wings cafeteria to discuss how they should move forward and which position they should take. Reen starts by pointing out they will need a third way, separate from the reformist and noble factions. Of course, each one of them also has some sort of family member to be concerned for. And speaking of family, during their meeting, Vita appears as a hologram via Grianos and makes it clear that there is something above them. Rushing out, the group find the Noble Alliance's flagship, the Pantagor, in the sky, right above a male. Reappearing in the flesh, Vita tells them that their preparations have now been complete. However, the guest of honour is Crow and Ordine, the Azure Knight. Reen calls in Valimar and is determined to get over as many obstacles as it takes, at which point Zeno, Leo, Altina, Blueblanc, Duvali, McBurn and Rufus all appear, surrounding them in a mare. Reen and Crow fly off to the side to duel. Sharon and Claire take on McBurn, Duvali and Blueblanc. Sarah and Tovor face Zeno, Leo and Altina. The rest of Class 7 decide to split up and help them, but not before Rufus approaches them and challenges them, showing off his aura. Fee notices that his guard is perfect, and Yusus reminds us that he is a master of court fencing. The group fight their hardest, but Rufus is just too strong for them. He might even be stronger than Sarah. Reen worries for the group, but Crow reminds him to focus on him, and another fight begins. Crow makes it shockingly clear how massive the gap between Reen and Crow's skill is. And soon after the battle ends, Vita appears and is somewhat disappointed that everything turned out the way that she had expected. She casts a spell which opens up a phantasmal window showing Duke Cayenne who introduces himself. Among other things, he eventually invites Reen aboard the Pentacle to have a chat about the past, present and his future. Seems like he wants Reen to join the Noble Alliance, and if Reen agrees, the Duke will leave from Amir and leave it alone for the duration of this war. Reen decides to send Selene outside of Valamar, accepting the Duke's proposition. And so, all members of the Noble Alliance are teleported away from Amir. As the group look up to the disappearing airship, Reen follows in Valamar. The scene fades to black, and that is the end of Act 1, The Ashen Chronicles. Oh damn, that was a really long one. I totally underestimated how much content there is in this game, but hey, I finally got there. Just as they all got back together, we have another separation. Let's hope Reen comes back safely. Thank you for being here for this video, each and every one of you is appreciated. Please don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and continue moving forward relentlessly without looking back. Peace.